Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. This week's video is going to be a little bit different so I normally like to keep my channel upbeat and light-hearted but that doesn't necessarily always make it practical and helpful and I like to be helpful. So this week's video is going to be about grief so trigger warning if you are not comfortable with discussions about grief if it's too soon for you i can completely get that uh but this video might not be for you so i put a question box on my story as always and my trusty followers sent me in loads and loads of questions and like, i already had like a breakdown going through the questions and then like choosing what ones to ask oh luckily i've done it when i was in the bath so i mean top tip if you're grieving crying in the bath is very practical. I am just trying to stall here. <laughs> I don't know how long I am going to last without crying. I've already cried today, but twice I think. So hopefully I've run out of tears. I'd never have done that, but maybe this is it. Um, I'm going to try my best with not crying and <laughs> wish me luck. So here it goes. If it's not too personal, Please can you talk about the healing process of grief? Oh gosh, that is a process that I believe is lifelong because no matter the amount of time that's passed, you can still feel such a range of emotions. Like you can feel the same emotion that you did the day it happened 10 years later. So unfortunately, there's no textbook way of dealing with grief. There's no, oh, stage one, stage two, stage three. It completely depends and it is completely personal to you. My dad's illness is terminal. Oh, question two and I'm gone. Let me just get this question out. Oh, right, let's just go with it. My dad's illness is terminal, but I can't get my head around it. I'm in such denial. How did you cope? Clearly not very well. <laughs> God is that word. In my house, we never really used the word terminal, ever. It weren't a word that we thought, weren't a word that we said. And like in my head, I was just living by the phrase like, it's not over until it's over. And like, like God works in mysterious ways. So like I wasn't giving up. And whether that was just denial, maybe, but it's just how I, I coped and that's how I dealt with it. Because I think if I just accepted the fact that there was like a time scale, like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have handled it very well. How do you cope with the fact that he's gone? My dad died five years ago next week and I still can't accept it. Yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think I'll ever accept it. You kind of manage it, but then sometimes it just hits you and you're like, oh my God, like, how long has my dad, so my dad's been five years as well. Sometimes I, like, I feel guilty that I've been able to like live five years about seeing him. So yeah, I don't think you ever accept it. Do you have any tips for hard days, like Father's Day, birthdays, and anniversaries? I'm starting to realise that I probably wasn't the best person to do this. <laughs> because I have no <laughs> advice. I am shit. <laughs> um, I mean, I think people do think that, well, this is just me talking pers uh, from my personal experience. I do think people seem to think that like 
the anniversary of their death is hard, harder. But honestly, <laughs> I, every day is hard <laughs> without like getting a little violin out. Like every day is hard. Like I don't miss him any more or any less on that day. It's just a day where something happened and maybe that's just because my my experience was a, a gradual one rather than like a sudden one maybe that would be different but yeah every day's hard <laughs> father's day i dread i remember my dad's last father's day and he was in hospital because he wasn't very well and i remember I literally spent about three hours picking out a card because <laughs> I just wanted it to be perfect and um I wrote like I got like a big card and I wrote like a whole page of stuff that like, looking back I'm glad that I was able to say things to him in that card obviously I didn't know that was going to be the last one like you just never accept that ever normally like on father's like my dad's if my dad was like buried over here or we had his ashes over here maybe i'd like go to a grave or something but um my dad's ashes and headstone are in ireland that's where he wanted to go with these like my nan and granddad his mum and dad are, are buried over there and that's where he wanted to go uh, yeah father's day i normally just put an instagram post up <laughs> um such a millennial and just try and forget the rest of the day what are some self-care things you do on those really hard days honestly cry <laughs> like i feel like with grief it can be a very dangerous game to play the bottling it all up like i'm a very firm believer of crying <laughs> um so i do think when it comes to grief self-care is not denying yourself that opportunity to grieve that opportunity to cry when you first lost your dad did you feel confused i feel like i can't comprehend it at the moment i felt delirious the world was kind of just passing me by i had like just over a year of knowing he was ill so there was there was days i found in that time the time when he was ill just absolutely unmanageable like i feel i feel like when it comes to cancer i fucking hate that word like it's so, so bad but like when it comes to cancer sometimes death is like the nicest thing because the, the battle no like, i definitely have ptsd from that <laughs> Ultimately, you don't ever want to see your parent or your loved one like in agony, like suffering. So, obviously, like I knew that he was every day. So after he did pass, knowing that he wasn't suffering anymore, he didn't have tissue, <laughs> knowing that he wasn't suffering anymore, it was a nice feeling. I feel like it kind of over over took my loss just knowing that he wasn't in pain anymore did you notice a difference between how you and your brother grieved oh completely I was 22 when my dad passed away and my brother my brother was 15 I just feel so bad for my brother but every boy needs a dad. I feel guilty. I've got more time with my dad than, than he did. And I also think it it probably helped me that I knew every step of like the medical side of the journey. Like I went to like the cancer clinic. It was every Thursday, or Tuesday. Like I would talk to my mum and I would talk to my dad and I had something to focus on. My dad didn't want my brother to know how ill he was and I think my brother was 
more than happy with not knowing i feel like that's probably a boy and a girl thing like girls just want to know everything and they want to fix everything or i do anyway whereas for my brother it was just easier for him not to know but now looking back i don't know whether that then made the actual like final days even harder have you ever dealt with losing a close friend so young if so how did you deal with it i lost a friend a month before my dad started getting ill and that was the first death that i'd experienced that wasn't from an illness or an accident or anything like that it was like through the hands of someone else and it was obviously it was sudden like one one night went to bed the next day i remember seeing all, like all pictures on instagram and I, I remember seeing the first picture thinking oh i didn't know it was his birthday today like i'm sure <laughs> his birthday's not now and then like starting to read the captions thinking what is going on i rang my best friend who was this guy's um best friend and that was hard that was that was the it was just a, a completely different set of emotions i've ever felt before before that i'd only lost grandparents and like i said it was like they was old and they'd been ill it wasn't necessarily unexpected whereas this one it just completely changed my experience of grief like i said when when a death is caused by someone else that was completely unfair understatement of the year i was very angry i remember being and then a month later my dad got ill and then it was just like, like what is going on here <laughs> did you have any friends that could relate to your situation yeah and that was probably the single best thing that could have happened to me like i don't know how i would have got through that that time and every like every day since um without my friend so my best friend emma her mum passed away six months before my dad and just knowing that there was someone there that i didn't even need to speak i didn't even need to say what was wrong she just knew and vice versa and literally we still cry all the time my dad died suddenly if you could swap places would you that is a question that me and my mum talk about and like just it's spoken about quite frequently and i just don't know like i had over a year with my dad knowing that he was ill and there was definitely things that we spoke about in that time that we would never have spoken about normally in my family like me my mum my dad and my brother we're not like a family that says love you all the time or was like overly affectionate or like, we never really said love you or things like that but it didn't need to be said. I never ever questioned it. Maybe with my teenage drama queen years I did. You don't love me. But I just never questioned it. I knew it. I didn't need to hear it. I remember obviously when my dad was ill. Like I would say love you to him. And even though. Like it would feel so weird saying it. I just thought you know what. Like I'm going to look back one day. I wish I said it. And don't get me wrong. Oh my god I wish I like said it every second like hi dad love you bye dad love like, i wish there would never be enough love yous but i'm glad that I, I did have those opportunities where we could say it to each other i really struggled with the thought of my mum moving on my dad my dad died eight years ago and i still can't cope um I don't, I don't even, I can't even have that conversation. So I don't even know why I chose that question. <laughs> I can't even talk about that question. My mum, I feel like in the months after my dad died, I was like so angry at my mum. Not 
angry, but sometimes I feel like I did used to have anger think at the thought of my mum moving on. Even though that was never a conversation, it was never a topic, but I don't know why. And I probably did take some of that stuff out on her that I shouldn't have. But then I never wanted to tell her <laughs> why I was angry because <laughs> I didn't want her to know that I was thinking that. Um, I suppose you do know. <laughs> um, but no, that's not something that I can um, think about or talk about. <laughs> In one breath, you feel so guilty because, like, my mum was only like 49, 50 when my dad died. I feel like you're so young and like, <laughs> you deserve to be on your own. <laughs> I don't want to be of anyone else apart from my dad. <laughs> How do you cope with seeing a strong person in your life become ill? That that was definitely, I think, the hardest part for my dad. Like, my dad was a big, strong man. He was, like, six foot two. Like, just a big man. So to see what chemotherapy and what that does to a person, like one of the hardest parts of it but I think that was when he started feeling most vulnerable when he knew that he couldn't just the effects of chemo don't know how that's a cure have you ever had to rush them to the hospital yeah so there was one time my dad had sepsis just like from treatment and he was being really sick we didn't know it was sepsis and he was literally being like projectile vomiting sick and like I kept saying like you okay you okay and he was just like yeah yeah I'm fine and I thought no you're not I didn't know what to do so I went into the garden, I remember I went into the garden and I tried to ring an ambulance but the closest hospital to us, which I'm not going to mention um, they're just absolutely horrendous I can't I can't speak any worsely, is that a word? about them if I tried, like, they are just horrendous but that would have been the closest hospital to us so if I was to ring an ambulance that's where they would take us but I just didn't know what to do so I went into the garden I tried to ring an ambulance and my dad came out like running out and he screamed at me he's like what are you doing and I was just like ah and like, the man on the phone was like are you okay and I was like yeah you're fine my dad was like if you ring an ambulance they're gonna take me there and they're gonna kill me because he just that like, they're the ones that basically gave him sepsis and then we went there, I think it was the night before, when he had sepsis, bearing in mind sepsis is fatal. And I took him up there, we was there for like eight hours and they told him that he was just constipated and he should go and have a bath. But I still get very violent thoughts about them when I think about them. Um, and my dad just knew that if he went there again, like it's probably the same thing. And I don't even want to think of the outcome that would have happened. Uh, so I hung up and then they ran me back and I was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> um, but my dad, so my dad said he'd go to the hospital with me, but I had to drive him. So he went, he had like a, he was having treatment at Guy's Hospital. So he had like a clinic appointment where you see like your consultant every Thursday, I think it is, or Tuesday. No, it's Tuesday because then treatment on Thursday. Um, so he was like, I've got an appointment there anyway. I'll just go there and they can like give me a once over. And I was like, all right then. So that was our plan. <clears throat> and I had a little Ford KA at that point. <laughs> so in terms of rushing him to the hospital, because my dad could feel like every bump and like he'd get nauseous. I was like rushing to the hospital, like driving like 20 miles an hour, like probably even less because I just didn't want him to feel any bump or feel sick or anything like that. Um, and then we got there and he had a cons consultation and what, what not and um, 
he'd had chemo, he'd just started it. So I remember him not knowing whether he was ill or whether this was the effects of chemo. And I remember sitting in the room with the doctor and she went, are you, so are you okay where we're And he said, he's been sick and he feels this and he feels that. And she was like, no, it, it, this all sounds like um, the normal side effects from chemotherapy. And he was like, okay. And I remember him going, see, I told you. And I was just like, oh. And then he put his jacket on and she was like, look, just before you go, I'll take your temperature just to make sure that everything's fine. And he was like, all right then. So she took his temperature and he had a temperature through the roof. And I remember her going, oh no, this isn't right. And we literally got rushed to a side room. And had she not have checked his temperature, he had his jacket on, had, he not, had she not have checked his temperature, we would have been going home and he probably would have died that night. And I remember being put in a little side room and he just wanted the lights off. <laughs> he wanted the lights off. So <laughs> my mum was, my, my was on her way out there from work. He was like laying in bed and I was sitting in this little side room, just in the pitch black. <laughs> waiting <laughs> not moving not making any sound just literally in the pitch black <laughs> um and then my mum come up there and literally it was almost like he was holding it in because as soon as my mum walked in it's not funny but i'm just saying that poor mum <laughs> um as soon as my mum walked in he just started being so violently sick that even the the doctor said look i'm not sure what's wrong with you in the minute but i'm just gonna give you everything and then we'll do some blood tests and whatnot and I remember just like seeing the doctors there and crying and oh but then yeah we found out it was septis and luckily he got better from that how did your dad tell you he had cancer sending love to you I know this topic's hard oh thank you um so my dad got ill in the July July 2015 and he he went yellow like a Simpson like he was driving, he, had, he was a black cab driver and he was driving in his cab and he said he looked in the mirror and his eyes had gone yellow, like the whites of his eyes. I remember him ringing my mum saying, I feel okay but something can't be right because I've got <laughs> yellow eyes. So he was like, I'm just going to drive straight up to this hospital that we won't name. It's in Woolwich. Uh, I'm just going to drive up there because that was the A&E that was closest to us and... Um, just go to the A&E and see what happens and then he ended up uh they'd done a blood test and he's bilirubin levels which I believe is the oxygen in your blood or some some shit like that I don't know um was sky high and they couldn't work out why so they kept him in I think he was in for like three or four days and I just remember thinking something is not right here like everything they was trying or everything I was doing just weren't working and I remember them going oh we think you might have hepatitis B and they thought he might have got it from touching like dirty money in the cab but they weren't sure so we was like so you think he's got hepatitis B but you're not sure you don't know how he's got it doesn't really fill me with much optimism they could see that something was pressing on his bile duct and that was the reason why he'd gone yellow because his bile duct was closed and um all of the toxins was coming out into his body and like his skin and whatnot um so they put a stent in his bile duct which is the reason why he got sepsis because they didn't put it in properly um and then he kind of felt normal again because his bile duct was open but obviously we needed to work out what was pressing on it um, and I remember I was in the hospital with my dad. He had had a CT scan and I remember him, I just had this bad feeling, thinking something's not right here. Everything they're doing is not finding out what is the root cause of this. And I never said the word cancer in my head, but I feel like it was kind of in there. And I remember him ringing me and saying, just to let you know, he left me a voice now, just to let you know, They'd done the CT scan today and um, the doctors just popped his head in and said that we didn't find no blockages and we didn't find no shadows or anything like that, so that's good news. But he was going to come back the following day and give me a full breakdown. 
And he was like, oh, no, I'm feeling a little bit better today. And I was just like, thank God. Like, I hadn't spoken it into existence. I hadn't told anyone around me. I hadn't told my friends or my family what I was thinking. But I was thinking that it might be like a tumour. And thank God they've not found anything. Like, thank God. And I remember just sitting there thinking, this is all going to be all right. And then the next day they were discharging him. So I went up to the hospital to get him. He was, just as I got there, he was kind of putting his clothes on and whatnot. And he was like, yeah, I feel all right. And I was like, oh, okay, good. And then this consultant at this fucking hospital popped his head in and was like, hi, Mr. Phillips. Um, just to let you know, I actually read the results wrong and there is a blockage. There is a tumour there. Uh, but we're not too sure whether it's benign or malignant yet. So we're still going to send you home and someone will be in touch with a treatment plan. And then shut the door. And then me and my dad was just sitting there. Like, in shock. Just staring at each other. I remember I started getting pins and needles in my lips. The fucking room started spinning. I, was, I just went into like, the toilet and the little side room. I was just sitting there like having a panic attack. Thinking, what on earth? am I going to do? And then I came out and then my dad's first words to me was you've got to swear on my life that you can't tell your mum because he just didn't want my mum I think he was obviously just trying to protect my mum. My mum had lost her brother and her dad to cancer obviously my mum's going <laughs> to find out but he just wanted to kind of I suppose protect her for as long as possible which would have only have lasted a few days after that, but I just remember, I remember driving home, like driving home and almost not even seeing the roads, almost just driving home from memory, just thinking, what on earth am I going to do? And how dare that consultant tell us something like that just by popping his head into the room? His card is marked. I have not forgotten. My mum passed due to a terminal illness. Do you find you suffer from health anxiety now? I don't suffer from it about myself personally. Like I probably live a little bit more wild now because I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> um, but I definitely suffer with it in terms of my mum because I'm like, I've only got one parent left. Like I'm hanging on by a thread here. <laughs> um, so I, my mum told me the other week, it was a month ago or so, um, She's like, oh, I got my uh, invitation to go and get a uh, mammogram done because once you're over the age of 50, sorry, mum, um, you have to have like routine mammograms. And I just remember thinking, not again. Like, uh, like I can't cope. Like, please, God, like, surely God won't do this to me. Like, <laughs> um, and that was horrible. That was so, so horrible. And then I remember. I, and then I started saying to myself, well, if they find something on the mammogram, that's good because they found it and it means that she didn't have symptoms. Like, I was just thinking of all of these things and going to like autopilot. Um, I didn't want to tell anyone I was having these thoughts because I didn't want to speak it into existence. So when she um, messaged me and she was like, oh, I've got my results, it's all clear. I was just thinking, oh. like, I felt like it was the first time I breathed. So... I definitely, if, if I hear my mum cough, I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? Um, I definitely have it for my mum. But for me, no. I'm like, I've had enough. <laughs> what was something you found helpful that other people did? Talking about my dad. I went for a, a walk the other day with my one of my best friends, Connor. And he just started talking about my dad. And that's what I like. But obviously, Connor knew my dad, so... It's probably easier for him than it might be for other people. But my dad isn't a secret. It's nice when someone asks you a question about them. So that is definitely something helpful. If you've got a friend that is grooving someone, obviously don't bring it up every two seconds. Like, hi, how's your dad? <laughs> um, but let them know that you're aware and that you're thinking about them and that they can talk to you about it at any time. How do you deal with thinking about your future Weddings and babies, etc. without them. Not good at all. I can't watch any wedding without crying. Not just for me, but like for my dad. Like, 
I'm sure my dad thought they were gonna like walk me down and up the aisle. So yeah, to know that I'm not gonna have that. I just don't know how I'm gonna cope. What do you do when people assume you have both parents? I lost my dad a few years ago, but I still hate this part. This is probably gonna make me sound like an absolute psychopath. YOLO. I go along with it. That's so weird, ain't it? Because they're probably gonna think after that, oh my God, what a nutcase. But I feel like I, I go along with it, partly to kind of like, shield them from embarrassment or like feeling bad about just assuming because of course you're gonna just assume like i don't take offense to it but i also don't want to be like if someone says oh like so like what do your parents do i don't want about my dad's passed away like talk about killjoy <laughs> so normally I, I would just use like past tense Depends on the situation and how awkward it is. Sometimes I'll just go, oh, my mum does this and my dad did this. And then sometimes they clock on from like the past tense. Um, but yeah, just go along with it. <laughs> how did you mentally cope with the role reversal of taking care of them instead of the opposite? For me, personally, I took great honour in it. It really did make me feel good that I could take care of my dad and know that he could rely on me. It's almost like repaying him for everything he'd done for me in my life. I remember when he came out of hospital one time, he came home and I remember him saying, oh, could you um, really fancy something lemony? Could you like go to the shop and get me some like... Um, lemon like ice lollies or something and i was like yep so i went to the shop and i think i literally bought every lemon flavored item they had in that shop i left with like bottles of like still lemonade fizzy lemonade pink lemonade lemon ice lollies lemons and i came home and i was like i've got you whatever you want like whatever you want i'm sure it's here and he was like all right calm down <laughs> but yeah just anything you want in i just I wanted just to make his life a bit easier. How do you stop being jealous of other people's healthy parents? <laughs> that would sound like such a funny, like, worded question, but I completely get it. <laughs> um, I don't know how you stop. Because I am still jealous. Like I said, like, I, don't, I know people that are in their 50s that have still got their parents, and I'm like, the maths ain't mathing. <laughs> Can you ever really be prepared for your loved one's passing? I don't think you can be prepared. There is absolutely no pain like it. It's a physical pain. Like it's actually physical, it hurts. And nothing will ever compare to it, ever. How did it change your perspective on life? My dad's illness and my dad's passing completely changed me i do think ultimately it was for the better um i feel like i'm such an empathetic person now i feel like i can feel everyone's heartache a lot more because i can relate and it just made me want to do something with my life not that i never wanted to before i did obviously want to before but not just make money or anything like that like i want to do something with actual purpose i don't just want to do something with my life that will guarantee that i will have a good life and my family will have a good life i want to do something that just makes other people's lives better because life can be shit let me tell you and some people are dealt the shittest cards and they sh they don't deserve it and i think that's why i like I, I loved working for the local council. I loved being involved in in decision making because you you go to, you go home you go to bed and you feel like you've accomplished something, and there's someone out there now that is having a slightly better day because of things that you've done and changes that you've made. And I definitely want to 
sorry my nose is running <laughs> I definitely want to continue that and I'm very very fortunate now that obviously I've got a platform that I can make or hopefully or not make changes but I've got a voice now that will reach a lot more people than it would have before um, and everything that I do I just put it down to my mum and my dad like I'd not I would not be the person that I am now without them to they made me who I am I'm strong because of them I'm funny because of them well I'm funnier um I think I'm polite because of them like I just had the best mum and dad sorry I just I noticed I said it in past tense <laughs> I have the best mum and dad <laughs> how do you stay so positive and upbeat <laughs> like people are going through the worst times of their life that I'm sure everyone's seen Ashley Kane and his girlfriend and his lovely daughter like none of us have any right to complain about anything when there's people out there that are going through that it's hard lo like losing your parent and it's hard seeing your parent battle cancer but uh, a baby <laughs> there's no sense in that at all so that is it guys i'm so glad i got through that video about crying thank you for everyone that sent in their messages all of my condolences to anyone that messaged me who are currently grooving a loved one i know it's hard i can't guarantee that it gets better but i can guarantee that you will get through it and in those times when you're struggling just think of your loved one and that they wouldn't want you to be so sad over them they might for a little bit but they wouldn't want you to waste your whole life grieving them so i promise that i'm going to do my next video on something that is not grief <laughs> something that won't make me cry it needs to be funny and it needs to be uplifting i might even have a special guest in it i wonder who that could be but thank you so much everyone please don't judge my makeup I hope you cried with me. I hope I'm not just sitting here embarrassing myself. <laughs>